seems funny to say it, but long before there was an art world, there was art in the world. For an artist in New York or in any towering modern city, it's very difficult to catch the interest of the public unless he designs billboards, or gas stations, or giant hot dog stands. I happen to be one of that happy band of pop culture lovers who thinks Nathan's sign is more delicious than its products. And I like signs that spin and sparkle and blow smoke rings into the night. What if you just want to make a work of art, like Chuck Ginever here, using the machines and the tools that made the city itself? Wants to make a visual statement that will confront his neighbor as he comes and goes from work. Maybe give a lift to his spirit, perhaps challenge him or stir him into new nonverbal ways of looking at experience. Who wants such things? Who will pay for them? Maybe because the competition is so stiff, and so ingenious, and the energy is so supercharged, the streets and parks of Manhattan are really a great place to explore what happens to art and what happens to us. When art steps out from behind the velvet rope, outside the pristine shelter of museums, galleries, private collections, and stands each day in the public eye. There was a sort of baby boom in the pedestal population between the Civil War and World War I. On much of it, pigeons have raised criticism to its loftiest heights. But they were men of genius at work, like Augustus St. Gaudens. The pure spirit of victory leading General Sherman may look a little quaint these days. But there's nothing quaint about St. Gordon's superb mastery of his craft. It must have had a stirring effect when it was unveiled on Memorial Day in 1903. Like many American sculptors of her time, Emma Stebbins studied in Rome. But 19th century Americans weren't ready for lusty mythological nudes frolicking in their fountains. Her healing angel of the waters has presided over Central Park's Bethesda Fountain for a hundred years now, surrounded by chaste statues representing temperance, purity, health, and peace, and by some of the park's most lusty and frolicsome visitors. The park's designers and curators have tried to resist for years an invasion of memorial sculpture, feeling that the park itself was a work of art. They couldn't resist the Khedive of Egypt when he offered them this obelisk in 1877. It was built by King Thotmes III in 1600 BC as an homage to the sun god, and just incidentally as a memorial to himself. There's no question which work in the park gets the popularity prize. The Tea Party of Alice in Wonderland by Jose de Creeft, who has done some other work on which I think he would prefer to rest his artistic reputation. As sculpture, it's the best scramble in the park by a nose.
the aristocratic Alexander Hamilton would probably have been pained to find himself in such oppressively democratic surroundings. But he might have unbent a bit when some citizen climbed to place a flower in his hand. Though neither work quite rises to the distinction of its subject, it's somehow very pleasant to find Columbus just across a path from Shakespeare. It sets one searching in vain for a pun of proper global magnitude. Ah, well, piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. The Shakespeare was sculpted by one of the major American artists of the 19th century, John Quincy Adams Ward. His work is seen really to better advantage in what I think is a very moving and familiar war memorial a melancholy statue of a single Union soldier of the 7th Regiment leaning on his rifle. Ward's best work in the park is a vigorous study of an Indian hunter with his dog. There could be a very glib and sentimental irony in contrasting the ennobling treatment of the Indian by American artists, while at the same time the Indian's own culture was being ruthlessly crushed. But I do think artists sensed long before most of us that we too were losing something, something very deep, very wise, and totally irretrievable. Ward's famous statue of George Washington seems to be gesturing caution to the New York Stock Exchange across the way, on the pediment of which Ward designed a work on a theme meant to inspire the leaders of commerce within, integrity protecting the works of man. Alongside Ward and St. Gaudens, stood another giant of 19th and early 20th century sculpture, Daniel Chester French, best known for his monumental statue of Lincoln in Washington. Like many artists, he felt portrait commissions did not give full vent to his imagination. It ran free in his statues representing the four continents in front of the Customs House in New York City. Aside from a grandiose majesty and beautiful execution, French's view of the four stages of development of the four continents give fascinating insights into how young America saw the rest of the world. Asia, the mother of religion, sits in a contemplative trance. The youth before her represents unquestioned obedience to the gods. Africa was slumbering in 1907, according to French. A lion at her left, the great sphinx on the right. Europe in Grecian gown, a book under her arm symbolizing her contribution to arts and letters. And the gloomy hooded figure of history studies a scroll and a skull. America, its recent past behind her, faces the future holding the torch of liberty. Everyone knows the real lady with the torch. She's nearby. And trying to discuss her as a work of art would be like evaluating George Washington as a surveyor. She does stand for an ideal with massive eloquence. And ideals became increasingly more difficult for artists to make clear in the century to follow. A park provides an attractive setting with space for a work to breathe. 
and some modern works need a lot of space. Chuck Ginever's work in Corten Steel leaves the sky to the architects and seizes a stretch of green earth. The technology of cold canyons is dramatically tilted in a suspenseful, oddly delicate balance. One American master has been doing a witty balancing act for years. If his mobiles don't reach out to tickle you, his stabiles invite you in with the grace of a genial host. Alexander Calder's Le Guichet at Lincoln Center. Seems lost without venturesome visitors. His companion at Lincoln Center, Henry Moore, calls his work a leg part and a head and arms part. The reflecting pool makes an awesome little island of Moore's familiar earth human forms, more human than ever amidst the rigid formality of the buildings. New York possesses at least one frail echo of the resounding genius of 20th century art. The architect I. M. Pei asked Picasso to select one of his works to be enlarged for this site. Portrait of Silvette displays the master's playful variation on an old Cubist theme that even the texture of sandblasted concrete can't really make Silvette into a heavyweight. The changes in the Picasso depend on the multiple views ordained by the artist. In the moving world of kinetic art, the wind, a machine, or the hand of the spectator as in this work by Yakov Agam at the Juilliard School, can rearrange the design to make it always new. Agam has said, art is not decoration, sculpture is not ornament. The true sense of real is change. If the wind changes when you're walking by the Burlington Fountains, you'll get a true sense of reality all over your clothes. Compared to the exuberance and sculptural richness of some fountains in Europe, most of the domestic variety seem to be either plaintive little bubbles or municipal demonstrations of water power. The Burlington dandelion fountains are a happy exception. The water becomes the sculpture. And the sculpture dissolves in the afternoon mist. Louise Nevelson gave this work to the city of New York as a gesture of thanks for its recognition of her distinguished career. A career identified largely by constructions like these, with their interior domestic mystery, at once sensuous and disciplined. The technical paradox enlarges the mystery. The curved forms grew naturally out of her work with elaborately formed wood, usually painted white, black, or gold. In night presences, she uses a steel which rusts to the rich brown of wood. There have been modern sculptures on temporary display in Central Park before. Here on the grounds of the Metropolitan Museum, an important work by Jean Arp. A rolling, joyous wave of stainless steel, celebrating a modern master's love for the simplest, most elemental forms of nature. This work by William Crivello at the corner of a midtown plaza raises some general questions about art in public places. There are some advanced artists who'd say, this is a piece conceived in a studio without any consideration for its suitability for this site, enlarged in a factory beyond its natural scale, planted here on a traditional pedestal to ensure that people give it the proper distance and reverence due to a work of art. Well, those are fair questions and maybe architects and artists should be pushing toward an art that, that grows with a more organic relationship to its surroundings. For now, I will just enjoy the hungry grip this strange blue magnet takes on the air and the bold interruption of the daily pedestrian stream by one man's vigorous love for form. Did I hear you ask, what does Leonardo da Vinci have in common with Dr. Athelstan Spielhaus? Dr. Spielhaus is a scientist an oceanographer, 
who designed this sunken plaza in front of the McGraw Hill building, including that startling steel triangle which looks remarkably like a modern piece of sculpture. It's actually tracing continually the relation of the sun to the earth. Its sides point to the four seasonal positions of the sun at solar noon in New York City. I don't know much about science, but I know what I like. And I like this just fine. Let's see, press release, 42 feet high, 25 tons, group of four trees, French artist Jean Dubuffet, Chase Manhattan Plaza. Layers of fiberglass, aluminum, plastic, like a sandwich painted with polyurethane and black and white to prevent the leaves from collapsing under the weight of a heavy snowfall, to keep the whole thing from going up like a giant kite. They designed a tubular steel skeleton described as a plumber's nightmare. The artist himself said, these trees are remotely related to trees which nature offers us. They belong to the world of the genesis of the spirit, of its teeming expectancy projected in a tormented efflorescence. The aim is to present embodied under an implicative form of trees and exalted in monument operations and edifications which belong strictly to a mental realm. I've been told that on a weekday, a lot of people from offices in the financial district stand at the rail on their lunch hour and stare in meditation at the sunken rock garden by Isamu Noguchi. In the warm weather, there's a slow trickle of water from the fountains, but it works just as well as a dry garden. The stones were brought from Japan, and they can be seen also by the people working in the offices below. There are not many places in town that can cast an 8th century spell on your lunch hour. Artist, Isamu Noguchi. Architect, Gordon Bunshaft. A place for art and an artist who knew how to use it. To me, it's the most stunning collaboration in town a brilliant exclamation point of art that deserves to speak for itself alone. Perhaps because it's so rare that an artist gets a chance to do public work that he tends to approach it solemnly. That's why it's a special delight to encounter a work like Busted Bike, complete with rack and plaque. I don't know what there is about bikes that brings on humor spasms. Here, a two-dimensional graphic shop sign with a three-dimensional joke. Two-dimensional public art is no longer confined to post offices or lobbies of public buildings. It's moving out amongst us in bold new forms. The City Wall movement in New York has been sparked by a group called City Walls Incorporated. Mel Pekarsky is one of its leaders. This is his work. This is the kind of neighborhood in which the artists often work, using walls that become exposed when the building next door gets torn down. The group is held together by frantic fundraising by some people who are generous with time and energy because they think that art brings color and life and a pride of ownership to some grim corners of a tough town. 
It's difficult not to be a believer when you encounter a work like this, a more recent Pekarsky work, a painting that is both abstract and suggestive of a mountainous landscape. Usually, riggers and sign painters execute the works from the artist's designs. Jason Crum did this abstract work called Peace, and the landlord was very proud telling me that he bought the paint. Two serious charges have been leveled against this kind of work. One, that they are somehow narcissistic, a gigantic ego trip on the artist's part. A charge difficult to sustain, since it's hard to find the artist's signature on many of them. The second is that they often do not harmonize with the drabness of the surroundings, that they shatter the essential vertical beige, gray, brown harmony of Manhattan. Alan D'Arcangelo is a well-known painter who did this earlier wall, now sadly crumbling. When the new Lincoln Center was built, it presented an indifferent back to this neighborhood. This was his way of saying, somebody cares. People who see abstract paintings in museums as merely masses of color or decoration may have difficulty in finding more in them when they're out of doors. Richard Anaskevich's painting on the YWCA grew from an honored tradition in art that goes back at least 60 years. And one doesn't need to strain to find in good abstraction some lessons of order or striving for balance for a voice for each individual element. Competing with some noisy competition, Romar Bearden used a more accessible language in a huge mural in Times Square. A jazz collage telling the people about all the free events available to New Yorkers in their city's parks vitality and the variety of its arts. There's a lot of public graphic expression around New York City these days. A lot of it is mindless vandalism. It has its critics and even some defenders. It seems to me at its most likable, sometimes most beautiful, sometimes touching, when it's alone, when it has a playground wall all to itself. On the other side of the playground, the City Arts Workshop has been channeling some of that expressive zeal by putting kids together with a professional artist. In this case, Arnold Belkin, who studied with Mexican muralist David Sequeiros. Belkin really created this work with young assistants from the neighborhood. The story against domestic imperialism leads from demolition and drugs, the bulldozer and the needle, to a family on the move with blueprints and slogans then to symbols of the new greener city to come. A teacher from the Metropolitan Museum's education department gave some kids some paint, some help, and a little freer rain on a wall behind the museum. Right on, teach.
This is a city that prides itself on the colorful diversity of its people. It's also a city that keeps jarring one's sense of history and place and one's eardrums by constantly remaking itself. So it seems appropriate to end our little walk back here between a work erected 70 years ago and one that seemed miraculously to just appear a few months ago. In this case, the old will stay, the new will go. The city has not yet decided on a permanent location for the Nevelson sculpture. Like the citizens who pass them, who sometimes rest near them every day, these two works and the artists who made them have more in common than appears on the surface. Both of these works underwent countless changes and transformations from the original models to their final products in bronze and steel. They are at the same time simple and complex. The Nevelson piece entitled Night Presences haunts us with a sense of things half recognized and dimly remembered, but as plain as day in its delight in undulating shapes. Because we do recognize General Sherman so clearly, and all that his name evokes, it's not so easy to see that he also cared about the abstract formal qualities of his craft, that his work is rich in elegant linear design with a love for texture and the pure beauty of form. And he added a lively sense of immediacy that was very rare in the public art of his time. Like us, both artists learned much from the great art of the museums. I hope that we've suggested that it can also be rewarding to look at the art that stands quietly in the midst of our harried lives, this splendid, scattered exhibition that is always open, waiting for us to walk by and spend just a little time. <laughs>